issue 25 and um, before we get started I wanted to show off uh, I told you I would do these off camera so these were ones that I did not use any uh, black on and they will look a little bit different than some of the other cushions that, like you can see there in comparison so I'm okay with that because this is actually going to be like inside of here and things that's in the gun turrets i'm going to go out on a limb and say they don't get this passage doesn't get used that much so the kind of dirtiness in that passage is just the accumulation of age and all that kind of stuff so i'm perfectly okay with them not having the black on it i could have added some but i decided against it uh i think i like it the way it is um I got a little bit sloppy putting some of the paint on, so I had to come back with the gray and hand paint some, but you can't really see it unless you're really <clears throat> looking close. So that's enough of that. Let's talk about this. And so here we are with issue 25. And before we dive in too far, let's go ahead and review this uh, this episode and see what the details are on it. Okay, so here we are with the details of this issue. So let's go ahead and get started. So we have uh, issue 25. We only had one video for that. We did the corridor and the main hold. Uh, we put those little uh, little fittings in there, replaced those screws. This whole issue took us two hours and 25 minutes. Uh, there was a total of five captures for this issue. Uh, we had a uh, total record time of 55 minutes and 27 seconds, but the video was edited down to 34 minutes and 53 seconds. We did not put in any screws. I could have subtracted screws, but I did not count those screws when we when I did those originally. So um, we added 30 uh, parts. We glued 30 parts in. Uh, we used primer, German gray, wood brown leather and brown or wood brown and leather brown and of course we don't know what the bonus video size was so let's go ahead and look at our video so we again we had 34 minutes and that came out to 34 uh, minutes blah 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 uh, total time so here's our counters so, so the first capture was six minutes we had a two minute capture and this was when I primed it, and this is when I painted it, so I airbrushed and showed that this time. We had a 10 minute, and the final part was 34 minutes, and that was doing the application and all that kind of stuff. Um, if we scroll over, uh, total record time was 55 minutes, and there was a hour and 30 minutes off camera. Part of that was, uh, I, as I mentioned, I did the... Um, the, the dry brushing and the, the weathering aspect of the corridor pieces off camera. Um, I did all that painting. Uh, not to mention the uh, sanding and the painting of those little buttons that I put in to replace the screws and all of that. So that took an extra hour and a half. Not count, you know, and that counted the, the cleaning of the airbrush and you know, all those different things. <clears throat> so overall... We have a total of 135 captures uh, to do 42 total videos. Uh, we have a total video time of 22 hours and 52 minutes, a total build time of 72 hours and 59 minutes, 
our average video length is only 32 minutes or up to 32 minutes and 40 seconds and again our shortest issue is 16 um, and we are up to 402 glued pieces and I used eight micro brushes this time so we're up to 161 micro brushes used so there we are let that uh, breaks down the this issue let's go ahead and get back to breaking down the actual magazine well again hopefully you guys are finding that kind of stuff interesting um, uh, I will keep doing it unless somebody uh, or enough people or whatever say you guys aren't interested you don't want to see it anymore uh, whatever so we're gonna I never realized that these were called the Starship fact files so we got the Starship fact file about the Delta 7 uh, Athra Sprite Starfighter and so this is a Starfighter. It's from the Quat System Engineering. It's a subsidiary of the Quat Drive Yards, which is uh, they did uh, pretty much all the stuff for the Empire. Uh, blah blah blah. Um, crew is one pilot and an astro droid, astromech droid. Cargo is only 60 kilograms. It's eight meters long. Speed is 12,000 kilometers per hour. It is stupid fast. Um, in comparison to all the other ships we've talked about, you know, uh, I think the Falcon's only like a thousand or something like that. So it's really, really fast. It's got a class one hyperdrive when you're using the boost ring. It's a uh, hyperdrive system is a Siluri 31 hyperspace docking ring to time co SDS eight by five dual laser cannons one kilometer per shot max or kiloton per shot max or quad pulse laser cannons optional warhead launcher and simple deflector shields so it's pretty interesting so this is the jedi starfighters and um it uh this is the um these replaced the earlier delta sevens as the Older models were lost in battle, so these are the seven Bs. So they had the Delta Sevens, and then they had the seven Bs. And so I'm not sure what the Delta Sevens were uh, were like. Um, they may have been just those those little bitty ones with the like kind of the forks out and whatnot, but I don't know for sure. Uh, I'll see if I can find an image of one, and if I can, I'll put it here. I'm guessing I won't be able to find one though. The difference between the, them was the location of the Astromech socket, but they were otherwise broadly similar ships. That was the most obvious difference. Uh, so if we saw another one, we probably wouldn't really notice it very much. Sublight performance created by uh, engineer Walix Blissix, who would later design the V-Wing Starfighter and the A-Wing Interceptor. As the time of the Delta VII Astro Spite inception, the Starfighter size did not allow for a built-in hyperdrive. Although these, uh, there, some prototypes were fitted with experimental hyperdrive engines. The Astro Spite Sprite made up for this by having very powerful sublight engines, driving it to a maximum acceleration of 5,000 g and a maximum in atmosphere speed of 12,000 kilometers per hour. With the deflector shields on, you'd have to have those on because uh, otherwise the atmosphere and the little uh, uh, particles and whatnot would probably tear it apart. Um, so it's tiny; it's got a very tiny profile, uh, being very slim, and only eight mil, uh, meters long, made it difficult to detect and easy to hide from sensors. As a side effect of its small size, however, the Starfighter only had space for one pilot along with a slot for a modified astromech droid whose body size needed to be reduced in order to fit. Astromech was located on the port side and anybody that uh, is familiar with auto and and uh, on a whim uh, you guys have seen them do uh, Sea of Thieves and you would understand that port side is the left side. Um, so it had storage for spare parts and luggage. Uh, this came in handy when Obi-Wan was hiding from, or running from 
Django Fett and he released all of the spare parts uh, and made it look like he got blown up. So it did have a limited range uh, with only five hours of worth of fuel and air supply in normal sublight operations. It was too small to have its own hyperdrive. We just talked about the fact that you had to have the, those rings. Uh, so it had a ring and then they'd fly in and then the ring would clamp on and then that would give it a hyperdrive um, when it was docked. In the last months of the Clone Wars, uh, the surviving Aether Sprite starfighters began to be replaced by the Eta 2 Actus Interceptors. I think that's the one I was thinking of. Had like two projections, wings came out, and then they folded out. Um, and those would have been, I think, the ones that uh, Obi-Wan and Anakin flew at the beginning of uh, uh, Revenge of the Sith, if I recall. Um, if so, uh, I'll post a picture of that, uh, up here as well. So, um, graphic markings stationed on, in the hangars of the Jedi Temple and on Cor on Coruscant and other facilities, Athra Spites were available to use by all Jedi who needed them. Colors varied, but most were painted red before other shades were applied by individual pilots during the Clone Wars. The starboard wing of Obi-Wan Kenobi's Delta VII Anthro Sprite Starfighter was marked with a, symbolic, a symbol of a disc with eight spokes. This symbol uh, dated back to Bindo Monk's study of numerology where the number nine, symbolized by the disc and eight spokes, signified the presence of the Force in, unified, in a unified galaxy. The Emperor eventually... Personalize the symbol by removing two of the spokes to create the imperial uh, insignia. So let's, you can see it up here. And so uh, there we go. And uh, I'll post a picture here of the imperial insignia. Uh, so, yeah, this talks about Obi-Wan going and fighting Jango Fett, uh, and that was his ship, and he, then he flew from there and followed him to, uh, uh, I can't think of the name, where the Keelix were, um, and we talked about that planet, I'll think of it and <laughs> after I'm done recording. New technology, so this is the, our behind the scenes section. So Jedi Starfighter's triangle shape was inspired by the Star Destroyers in the original Star Wars. Industrial Light Magic uh, designer Doug Chang uh, identified Delta Sevens as one of the first designs to bridge the aesthetic gap between the classic trilogy and the prequels. Familiarity in its shape, <coughs> pardon me, along with the Star Destroyer's Imperial affiliation, gave added symbolism to the Jedi Starfighter's appearance and foreshadowing the Emperor's rise. Empire's rise to power that was to come. Chang uh, completed the Attack of the Clone sketch in November 1999. After that, Jay Schuster and others drew additional concept art. Then in May 2000, Peter N. Dorm completed the designs for the Jedi Starfighter. These were drawn completely by hand, the last to be done exclusively that way. While making Episode 2 in Sydney, the merits of Computer-aided design, CAD software, came to the fore, while the the work that Dorn had completed were used to build a full-sized, partially dressed ship with a fully detailed cockpit for close-ups. There was a lot of work and preparation required to understand how all the ship's elements would be brought to life, especially when it came to the cockpit area and how that fitted within the frame of the ship. The next vehicle after the Starfighter... Jedi Starfighter was the Solar Sailor, and that was the one that Dooku took off and went back to Coruscant to meet up with uh, the Emperor, or Palpatine, uh, Darth Sidious, if you will. Expressed as a digital drawing in addition to hand-drawn designs, the CAD system gave the artists more freedom to express their ideas and allowed for easier and quicker understanding, even though the changes had to be made in post-production. So there you go. And now we're going to visit Lothal. So if uh, if you've watched any of Rebels, uh, you'll be familiar with Lothal. It pretty much uh, the first several ep uh, episodes center or seasons center around Lothal. I have not yet watched season four. Um, 
I may have talked about that previously, but uh, I don't know if, if it spends much time on Lothal or not, but I would say 75% of the first three seasons are uh, on Lothal or, or, you know, something like that. So um, let's just have a look here. So it's in the Outer Rim Territories. Uh, it's terrestrial type 1, breathable oxygen mix. It's temperate savannas and shallow, gra uh, shallow seas. So this was actually pretty interesting. So basically, this talks about how Lothal uh, was a fairly recent planet to be discovered and um, uh, inhabited. And it had a very uh, simple but uh, effective agricultural uh, economy base. It, it, you know, it, that's what it was especially kind of um its main production was was its uh, ability to uh have the uh, um agriculture so uh, lothal had first seen been settled during the waning days of the republic when its rich resources were nurtured and harvested with great care keen to make the most of the gentle passive world those first travelers would establish farms and settlements families would work the land developing planets our agricultural reputation in the local systems there are two major uh, urban centers where the capital city and center central city were founded in those early years and uh, it was there that commerce and industry became the main focus as the planetary government was established and the planet's economy evolved so you know that was uh, kind of the one of the main things but uh, despite the hopes that Lothal would remain off the radar because it was, you know, way off the beaten path, uh, this fresh new world caught the attention of one of the galaxy's major shipbuilding companies. Not many planets had uh, the clout to refuse the mighty Sinar fleet systems, and Lothal was no exception. Uh, soon a factory where Imperial TIE fighters were built and assembled was constructed in Capital City. So, uh, before we turn the page here, let's go ahead and talk about the wildlife. Compared to many other worlds, the local wildlife on Lothal was thankfully large, non-threatening loth rats, loth cats, and loth wolves. Uh, were the extent of the larger animal presence on the planet, and none presented a sizable threat to the population, although loth wolves were known to plague farmers. As with many worlds across the galaxy, earlier, early settlers uh, brought with them the domestic pack animals from other planets, slumbering banthas and regular uh, regular sight across the Outer Rim territories were among those brought to Lothal. Along the many immigrant species that made up the population of the planet were uh, Aqualish, Godals, Humans, Ithorians, Rhodians, and Ugnots, a multicultural society like most modern planets, Lothal populations soon leaned uh learned that its diversity was one of its greatest strengths so that was you know pretty cool so basically uh uh basically the empire came in and they established these uh tie fighter um factories and all that kind of stuff and then they uh built an academy there for uh imperial uh military you know, their installation and the, and the academy and all that kind of stuff. So that's kind of uh, what happened with Lothal. Uh, driven, Tarkin Town here. So driven from their homes, uh, many Lotholians were forced to live in refugee settlements dotted across the planet. This unfortunate event befell the citizens in Tangletown, as most of the inhabitants were farmers. They proudly called Tangletown the fruit basket of Lothal. Given its rich supply of fruits and spices, but after the arrival of the Empire, a program of forced relocation drove them from their homes to the slums and shanty dwellings known as Tarkin Town. Named after the architect of this relocation program, Grand Marf Wilhelm uh, Tarkin, the uh, Will Huff, sorry, Will Huff Tarkin, uh, the town was a loosely cobbled together collection of huts and temporary buildings laid out around a central square, uh, forced to live a uh, hand-to-mouth existence, these farmers had little chance of ever escaping the settlement. 
So, yeah, um, Tarkin, you know, evil, blah, blah, blah. Uh, behind the scenes, this was a bit interesting. So, the inspiration for the look and design of the Star Wars Rebels is famously taken from the style of legendary Star Wars conceptual artist, the late Ralph McQuarrie. Uh, the shorter panels on the TIE Fighter and more angular mask of Darth Vader. Uh, these are informed by the man who created many of the iconic characters, vehicles, and locations of the original trilogy. So th those are the things that he was responsible for, right? Lothal itself owes a heavy debt to Macquarie as the inspiration of the rolling hills and vast plains uh, goes back to the pre-production on the return of the Jedi in the grassland world of Seismon. Um, never seen in episode 6 these designs were clearly very close to the to the Lothal w that we know interesting these same images were used in Macquarie and writer Kevin J. Anderson's the illustrated Star Wars universe to show specific areas of uh, other grassy worlds that of Alderaan so um, uh, this was a, a Macquarie painting which illustrates Star Wars Universe described the castle lands of Alderaan, where the ancient insectoid uh, Kilix built towering castle-like hive mounds in the plains. And so this was, was a concept art for uh, some of the plains on Alderaan, and uh, you can see that that is pretty much mirrored here on Lothal, so pretty interesting. Uh, capital city of Lothal is based on Macquarie's concept art for the buildings of Aldra, the capital of Alderaan, Princess Leia's homeworld. So uh, that would have been Aldra and Aldera, sorry. Um, and so that's pretty cool. Um, like I said, if you haven't seen Rebels and you are a Star Wars fan, I highly recommend uh, trying to catch some. Of course, you have to watch it on Disney Plus now. So, um, there's that. So now, in Secrets of Space Flight, one of my favorite parts of these, uh, these issues, is we're going to talk about the gyro computers. And this one I um, find especially interesting, and I'll get into that here in a little bit. So basically, uh, this is the AH-1701 gyro computer and such a small part is such a small part of the Krillian freighter's system that it's often overlooked by all but the talented engineer with keen eye for detail that it, that is mainly because the equipment is mounted behind the microaxial rubicon astrogation computer and is not physically accessible without dismantling the astrogation computer fitted in the cockpit starboard rear instrument panel it is essential equipment though is uh, the gyro computer is often easy for the captain and co-pilots to ignore because it operates behind the scenes in tandem with the aggregation computer. However, the sure way to realize exactly what the gyro computer does is try flying a starship which has its equipment damaged or removed. Any vessel in this condition will be severely crippled, sometimes catastrophically so. Uh, whether she is taking off from a fully equipped spaceport or something more impromptu, the Millennium Falcon couldn't manage without its uh, A1700. The Arrow computer helps the Falcon pilot keep her on an even keel when they are take off or land, and when they are faced with something as unexpected as the asteroid belt of the Hoth system or the uh, the hull of an unsuspecting Imperial Star Destroyer. Without the A7, such maneuvers could easily end in disaster. So. Basically, it's got a gyro computer, right? And um, it's uh, these types of things are actually used, or I don't know if they still are, but I know they they had been basically used in a lot of uh, um, planes and jets and stuff like that, uh, particularly the bigger ones. So um, uh, gyros are very significant to help feed that type of information to uh, the pilots. So the gyro computer comprises of gyro balance circuitry, which, when tied into the ship's sensors, gives it three-dimensional direction sensing capabilities. The circuitry feeds off two sources. The first is telemetry uh, broadcast by a network of billions of 
Galaxy-wide beacons and satellites set up for the job. Their signals help a starship to get its bearings uh, wherever it is in the galaxy. The signal also help a vessel to achieve stability in all three directional planes, whether it is in motion in space or stationary planet side. The gyro balance circuitry is also fed data by the gyroscope rotors, which spin rapidly on their axis at about 69,000 revolutions per second. The orientation of the gyroscope is not affected by any tilting of the starship. And flexible mounting means uh, that each spinning rotor stays the same in the same position no matter how haphazardly the ship is banked and rolled by her pilots. This means that it can be used to maintain a reference direction and ensuring that those in the cockpit never lose track of where they ha have been and are going. Such is the enormous amount of galactic data held by the microaxial Rubicon astrogation computer that the Incom AH-1701 gyro uh, computer uh, is able to keep tabs on the position of the starship relative to the galaxy capital on Coruscant, the Carillion star system, where the YT-1300 was built and the last port the ship lifted off from. So, state of the art, the best gyroscope computers in the galaxy came out of the top secret starship uh, starfighter development laboratories at Incom Corporation, best known for its Incom TT65 X Wing Space Superiority Starfighter. Despite the durability of the AH 1701, the corporate uh, cooperative agreement that exists between the factory that builds the YT1300 and the supplier that makes her gyro computer is unusual. Some, in fact, refused to call it that and describe it for the business deal that it was, a subcontracting arrangement that lines the pockets of executives at Incom while ensuring that the Carillion shipbuilder is able to produce the galaxy's best all-around freighter. Other applications, um, uh, they are commonly fitted in all manner of ground and water vessels. And they are also standard on many droids. Their gyro balance circuitry provides such machines with three-dimensional direction sensing capabilities or in the case of devices found in droids as part of the behavioral circuitry matrix gives them stability in all three planes so let's get in here to some of this so right here this is kind of showing how these gyro computers work so you have the actual gyro here and then it's going to be able to pivot on this it's spinning here and then as this turns um, this will stay in place and then what happens is um, the when that turns and this is staying in place uh, the force uh, of that is registered here and it's that force that is what gets calculated so and this here is demonstrating that you, you're going to have uh, gyroscopes uh, positioned in on all three planes so you're going to have one here one here and one here and so that senses every uh, direction that the, the ship's going to go. So uh, a gyroscope, uh, gy gyro computer is a starship positioning system that senses the vessel's location by analyzing a, a planet's magnetic fields and the telemetry translated by a galaxy-wide series of beacons. It collates the information by uh, using gyroscopic technology to locate and uh, steer the ship in three dimensions with pinpoint accuracy. Uh, the starship's attitude is stabilized by using control uh, by using control moon, moment gyroscopes (CMGs). Each CMG exists of spinning rotor mounted on one or more motorized gimbals that are able to tilt. The rotor will try to keep spinning in the same plane so as it tilts its angular momentum changes causing a gyroscopic torque that can be used to rotate the spacecraft to control the starship's uh, altitude or attitude excuse me in all three dimensions roll pitch and yaw at least three cmgs mounted at right angles to each other are needed so that's what i'm talking about it's got that gyroscopic force that it actually senses and um, that it's that information that is used. So um, I'll get into the behind the scenes here, but I wanted to talk about that a little bit. So 
when I was actually in the army, uh, I learned to repair a, um, it was called a PADS, Position Azimuth Determining System. And this is what the army used to um, do very fine location type stuff uh, before GPS became a thing. And so basically it had uh, two gyroscopes in it. It didn't have a third, I don't think. It's been a while since I worked on one, obviously. But um, so basically it had two. And what you would do is uh, you would take it to a known location. And, and um, basically like, you know, stateside, there's many things that have where they have known locations um, and they, you know, you would go there and you would say, this is the coordinates of this position. And you would drop a plumb bob on that spot. And the, the pad system would know exactly how far it was because of the boom that comes out uh, from that. And it would know that if you say, this is the position I'm at, then as you move, it can tell the direction that you're moving and all of that kind of stuff. And it could tell you on a map, basically on a grid map, uh, exactly where you were. Um, you would have to stop every 10 minutes uh, to kind of let it uh, somewhat stabilize and orientate itself. Um, and I can't remember how long you'd have to wait uh, during that 10 minute stop. But you can mount them in Humvees and other vehicles. Um, most of the time I saw them mounted in, in Humvees and other uh, you know vehicles like that. You can put them in helicopters as well. Uh, the majority of the time, they for the Army anyway, they were used for artillery. And so that way um, they could position the, the guns for the artillery and know exactly where those guns were and know the azimuths of the direction they were facing or what have you. And um, then that way when artillery strikes were called in, they would know exactly where they were firing. And that's one of the things that made that made uh, American artillery so accurate even back in the, you know, 60s, 70s, and 80s before GPS became a thing. So, yeah, um, pretty cool. That's one of the reasons why I thought this was interesting anyway. So, um, let's go ahead and talk about the seat stabilizers. Even though the astrogation computer on the Millennium Falcon has non-functioning, was a non-functioning prop that did not contain a gyro computer, the seat in front of it had a close connection with this technology. The set was dressed with an obsolete 1960s Martin Baker MK4 ejection seat. And I think I've talked about that one before when we were doing the cockpit. By the time Star Wars was made, so-called third generation ejection seats had become far more autom automated in real world aircraft with more sophisticated parachute and survival gear deployment, advances in electronics, uh, allowed the seat to be equipped with a computer that controlled its operation based on readings from sensors. These included instruments for measuring the speed of the seat and the pilot's weight. Together with gyroscopic stabilizers to control the seat's orientation, the programming of the seat computer was designed to allow ejection under a wider range of conditions and improve the crew's chances of survival. So even the seats in modern day, uh, at least at the time anyway, modern day uh, uh, ejection seats had gyroscopes. I don't know, like, like I said, this one was from the 60s, so um, this is talking about by the time Star Wars was made, this seat was obsolete. That's why they were able to get them so cheap, um, or cheap enough to use anyway, uh, and the newer ones had gyroscopes in them. So pretty cool. Uh, ease of access, and this is our last little bit of behind the scenes, the turret access uh, features during the escape of the Death Star and the New Hope when Han and Lua rush to defend the, the Falcon from TIE Fighter attack. Uh, Han climbs up the dorsal guns while Luke descends to the ventral guns or ventral turrets. It's clear from both sequences that the access is little more than a recessed doorway. Uh, while this gave good on uh, screen action, keeping the actors in shot, it later became obvious to the artists who worked on the plants of the ship that this geometry simply wouldn't work. Uh, some early blueprints did show a short straight corridor, but after the size of the ship was revised, and we talked about the uh, size of the ship actually being revised because it was, uh, you know, mostly the space in, in the, the main uh, hold 
where they spent so much time and all that, uh, they realized that that size of that space would not fit in um, the size of the, the Millennium Falcon that they had on set and all that kind of stuff. So they had to actually increase the size, um, at least on the blueprints anyway, to make it more realistic. Uh, it was realized that if the tunnel was to be in line with the gun controls, it would have to be further from the ring corridor. The solution was to introduce a longer access passage with an angle in the middle. So, with that, uh, we're going to say that's the end of issue 25, and these were the parts that we did, obviously. And in issue 26, we're going to have the floor and the ceiling. And you can see there, it mentioned the angle. So, um, internally, this is not the same as what they, they showed in the movies. This is what had been revised to what would have been more accurate and how it would have been positioned to get to that, that space. So, we're going to have those two. So, we'll get those painted. And then we'll have this piece here, which we'll get that painted. And then, of course, we got frame and all that kind of stuff. So, that's what we'll be doing in issue 26. So um, the fact that uh, some of these issues are getting a little bit longer, adding the details and stuff, um, I would definitely like to get your guys' feedback on, on how much you're enjoying these, these bonus pieces. If there's anything that you'd like to see me spend a little bit more time on, anything you want to see me kind of um, speed up, speed through or whatever, I'm going to try to kind of, get more of a concise, condensed version of some of these things. Um, I, you know, I tried this time, but again, talking about the gyroscopes, I wanted to definitely do that. So I added a little bit of time to this one. And so hope you guys are enjoying this and I will look for you guys all in issue 26. See you then. And may the force be with you always. <laughs>